Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for, uh, for joining. So um, I actually, uh, when Pivotal asked me to do a presentation, I, I said, well, what's the thing that uh, you, know, you really don't want me to talk about? And they said, um, .NET, you know, it's kind of a Java conference, they don't talk about .NET. So hoping that nobody would show up, I chose .NET and uh, mission accomplished. So uh, um, anyway, just kidding. Um, so uh, I did want to talk about .NET because uh, it's kind of important to Schwab, and that's the company I work for. So um, let's see if I can get this thing working right. Hold on. OK, there we go. OK, so uh, who am I? Nick Grabowski. Uh, I work for Charles Schwab. I run uh, an architecture team and the R&D uh, team for Schwab, both the centralized architecture and R&D reporting to my group. Um, so, you know, kind of what do I do? Uh, you know, I run engineering teams, uh, architecture teams, I'm a technologist, that kind of stuff. Um, I work for Charles Schwab and company now. I've worked in different uh, startups, retail spaces mostly as well. Um, and then I, you know, I sort of, the thing that sort of I'm passionate about, uh, making technology more efficient. So that's what I like to do. Um, so, who should, who should this be interesting to? Well, I'm hoping it's interesting to, to architects, leaders, engineering leaders, and, and data center operations folks. That's kind of what I tailor this to. So if you're, if you're expecting me to throw the, you know, um, the uh, um, development uh, IDE up there, it's not going to happen. Um, but uh, I think we'll talk about some interesting things. So uh, if, you, if you care about .NET and .NET apps in an enterprise, especially if you have a lot of them, this is, I, I think this should be interesting for you. And um, there's one assumption I made, which is that you already know something about Cloud Foundry. Um, so uh, if, if you don't and you need me to elaborate, just kind of yell out during the, the meeting. So I'll, I'll try to go through it, but if you have questions, uh, it's a small enough audience, I think just ask away and uh, I'll make sure we get through the whole, the whole deck. Um, so, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Schwab's situation. So we, we want to, uh, uh, you know, we have about 1,200 applications and, and we have this need to make, uh, you know, hosting those applications and running them as efficient as possible because every, uh, you know, inefficiency can lead to lots of cost for us. So we, that's what we try to do. So, um, so that's, that's our situation. Hundreds of .NET, Java, mainframe, legacy C apps. Uh, we're in a regulated environment, uh, which means lots of everything we do is sort of scrutinized by different, like four or five different regulatory bodies. Um, we care about security, uh, uh, as I'm sure our customers would want us to. Um, budgeting, we, we, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of CapEx, not a lot of OpEx. In other words, we we're okay buying software, uh, buying services, but we, you know, we have because of the business cycle, we have to be careful about having, um, you know, lots of engineers, uh, lots of uh, employees to to solve our problems. Because in a in a downward business cycle, we'd we'd have to do layoffs. We don't like to do that, so we have to be sort of smart about it. Um, obviously, like everyone, we care about availability, reliability. But when we aren't available, uh, our customers actually get we have to pay them money. We have to pay the SEC money, we have to pay other groups money, uh, fines and so forth. So we, we really care about it because we don't like to pay other people money. Um, and then if you know anything about the Schwab, Schwab, you, you probably see our brand. It's really important to us. Um, so um, that's important. OK, so that said, what were our goals here? What are we trying to achieve? So 1,200 applications, we want to bend the cost curve. Um, we want to reduce complexity. Um, Leverage available capacity. Um, that one probably maybe uh, deserves a little explanation. So, when you think about um, just this distributed space historically, right? It's been this space where you, you say, I want a couple of app servers or four app servers or I want some database servers. I'm going to run my application there. Well, that if your application has a small number of users, you can you can waste a lot of capacity that way. Uh, VMs help a little bit, but but the technology really hasn't um, gotten to a place where we can say we're efficiently using the capacity. So we wanted to be a lot more efficient. Um, 1,200 applications, you have some standard, uh, security standard, uh, um, you know, logging standard, something like that. Uh, 
how do you enforce that that's going to be done by every team? It actually becomes more difficult in the distributed space. In fact, the mainframe is an easier place to enforce that kind of rigidity. Um, better security, always a good thing. More, you know, better availability. We wanted to be better at agile and self-service. And uh, we wanted to be prepared for the public cloud because we think that's coming, but we're risk averse. So uh, we're not jumping right into it, but we want to be ready for it. Ultimately, do more, better, faster, cheaper. Not bad. Okay. Okay, so what did we do? So, so we were in this position in 2010-ish time frame, and there weren't really these passes out there for us to use, so like Cloud Foundry, um, OpenShift, those kind of things. So we kind of invented something on our own, and we call it shared environments, and we built two. We built one for our sort of Java workloads, where we got a lot of Java, and we built one for our .NET workloads. Um, uh, basically, the, the way it worked is um, each, the, this is, these are data centers. Uh, each, we would have like say 20 nodes in a data center. Each node is a VM of a certain size. Uh, we'd have IIS running on it. And we deploy, um, I think at this point we have 60 applications on each VM. And they're, you know, horizontally scales. Um, and this is, you know, this, this gave us a lot of advantages. It really Im improved our application density and so forth. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. So uh, over a sort of four or five year period, we avoided thousands of virtual machines. So virtual machines we would have created. So licensing, um, the, the capacity, the physical capacity needed for those. Um, and uh, we actually avoided our ops team kind of getting bigger and having to expand and manage, you know, another you know, these thousands of VMs. So that, that's really what we got. So that's been the cost curve right there. I mean, that is, uh, we totally achieved that. Um, uh, we did reduce the complexity of our deployments. So imagine hundreds of applications that now use the same start and stop script, the same deployment script, the same continuous delivery uh, pipeline. Um, that's what we achieved in both the Java and the, the .NET world. Um, and we leveraged available capacity. Um, uh, again, we'll, we reduce some complexity. I'll get to more why, why I'm not giving that a green check mark. Um, uh, but uh, same with the uh, leveraging available capacity. We definitely leverage more capacity, but uh, because we had to deploy every app to every node, um, we were wasting a lot of memory and um, <clears throat> adhere to our own standards. Again, if, you, if you're doing ton of applications exactly the same way in terms of deployment, in terms of the directory you log to, in terms of uh, a variety of it, what port you're using, you know, that you're using uh, the same version of IAS with the same patches on it. This, this allows you to adhere to your standards better. Do we improve our security posture? Not really. Um, it's pretty much the same. Uh, I think you, the benefit of having 1,200 applications deployed differently is, uh, security through obfuscation. You know, you can break into one, but you, you figured that out, but how do you get to the other, you know, 1,199? So, so for what we gained in conformity, in other words, we knew we had this firewall, we knew we had, uh, you know, users set up and so forth, we, we lost because of that obscurity loss. So um, we improved uh, availability, uh, reliability, again, conformity, uh, homogeneity really benefits there. Um, because we have a, con a better continuous delivery pipeline that can be used by more teams and it's consistent, that's, that's better. Um, do we prepare for the public cloud? You know, I used to think maybe we did, but, but uh, I, you know, the more I got into Cloud Foundry, the more I realized we probably didn't do enough. Um, but we did achieve a little bit more of what we wanted. Okay, so what were the... Let me dive a little, a little bit into the limitations of, of our shared environment. So um, we got greater app density. We got isolation character, characteristics. So IIS gives you like, you can basically have a VM, or not a VM, but a, an app die if it hits a certain memory threshold. Uh, so we got that kind of isolation. Uh, but not great isolation. We certainly reduced heterogeneity, lots more homogeneous, you know, two homogeneous environments, one for Java, one for .NET. Um, and CD, as I said before, was improved. But no elasticity. And I, and I think there's two types of elasticity we should care about. One is um, 
the elasticity of being able to deploy an app and say it's only two nodes versus it has to go to all 20 nodes. Um, so not dynamic elasticity, but just the idea that one app can have two and another app can have, can have 20 instances. Then there's the, the traditional elasticity concern, which is um, you know, that uh, during the day you scale up to, to meet your traffic needs, and at night you scale down, or time of year you scale up. Um, didn't have that either. Um, pets not cattle. So uh, does this, does everybody know what this is all about, pets not cattle? Lots of head nodding. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, it's, it's easier to treat these as cattle, uh, but it's still the, the potential because a sysadmin could log in and put a patch here or, or make an edit there. They actually, you know, second law of thermodynamics took over and the things start to become out of whack over time. Um, different nodes actually have different things installed on them. Uh, uh, containerization is limited and security features are limited. So uh, I try to show some of that here. So like uh, if, you, if you broke in and you got hold of node, which I call pet one, you could, there's no firewall between that node and these other nodes so you could move over and, and get to these other nodes. So there's uh, some threat vectors that this enables. Um, okay. Okay, so, so that was like 2010 through 2013-ish, right? We were like, okay, we figured it out, it's working, but we're finding limitations. So what do we want to do next? So, um, you know, this was, you know, Puppet, this is like, you think like people are like, oh, you should use Puppet to, you know, configure the environment and like, you know, uh, fix all these problems, create your firewalls dynamic, dynamically, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was like, that's just rubbish. You know, that's not going to work because you're not going to be able to um, uh, roll back from changes. There's all kinds of problems with it. So, we looked around at all kinds of vendors, and we we sort of chose uh, Cloud Foundry for. Um, we just felt it was the best platform at the time, um, and it gave us these things that were missing uh, from our uh, from our uh, our own shared environment. You know, true elasticity, lifecycle management, which I'll talk a lot about. Uh, next, and the better containerization, and which continues to improve, and then improve security posture um, through no east-west uh, access, et cetera. Um, and these goals, we really felt all of these could be achieved for Java, and for the apps we're deploying there, we feel like it is achieved. We feel like we're getting, we're just way ahead in every one of these areas that we were kind of, than we were before. In fact, from a security perspective, you know, I had a security team that was, for Charles Schwab, who was just saying, you must, they were passing all these sort of virtual machine distributed kind of context rules around, you must have a firewall that does this, and you know, all these other kind of rules. And as we introduced them to what Cloud Foundry could do, they, they, they noticed that IP tables could, um, could, could stand, you know, could work. They noticed that with no developer access to the machines and the nodes, that would, really limit a lot of security threats. Um, no east-west access, only north-south through the environment. Also, just took away problems. The complication of integrating AD also actually alleviates a lot of security concerns. Um, because you, I'll get to this later, you really shouldn't try to integrate AD and the benefit of not doing that is a security advantage. So that's what we got with Java, but um, but not quite .NET, and so I'll, I'll come to that next, but um, uh, let me talk a little about here. So for those who don't know too much about Cloud Foundry, I think the key here is the Bosch. The, the thing that we didn't have with our shared environments is this ability to create you know, new nodes from scratch. When we needed to upgrade, we just delete the nodes, create new ones. Um, so no upgrades, um, just essentially uh, dynamic automated re-imaging re when needed. Um, that's the lifecycle management. And that really turned the corner from the sort of, we, we thought we had gotten rid of the pets, but this really has allowed us to get rid of the pets. I mean, I don't care about any of the server names in our PCF instance, uh, and I don't ever intend to. Um, uh, there, there really just is no need to know. Uh, and that, that's a huge win. Uh, with Run C, containerization is far more robust. Um, we were, we were living with WebSphere 
JVM sort of containerization before, but now with this, it's it's just very very difficult to um, uh, for an application to be a noisy neighbor, and uh, also add some security features. Okay, um, I'm gonna keep rolling along. So, okay, so .NET parity. So so okay, Java great story. .NET not so much. Um, so last year uh, in November, Pivotal in the Cloud Foundry community, great, we've got .NET, or we, Windows works in, in Pivotal, uh, but Bosch doesn't work. And, uh, and that's a big problem because you don't get the lifecycle management. And so if we don't have the lifecycle management, well then some of the security features, you, you now need the admin to go get into the box. Uh, the, these, it starts, the, the value of Cloud Foundry actually starts to degrade pretty Pretty heavily. I, I should say it's not that Bosch didn't, doesn't work. It still would deploy your app and so forth to the to the Windows machine, but it doesn't handle the lifecycle management of the OS and the, essentially the platform, which is a big deal. No stem cell and and so forth. Okay, so Pivotal obviously recognized that the Cloud Foundry community recognizes that, and so um, they worked hard to go down two two routes. And this is the these are the routes that you should care about, in my view. Um, so um, versus Bosch Windows, so um, this is essentially like a Linux VM now in, in Cloud Foundry. It, uh, the CF you know, creates the VM, tears it down, handles all the lifecycle management, um, and, and that's a huge win. And, and, and I think you need to care about this if you're a .NET shop because uh, you've got a lot of legacy code and um, Migrating it to .NET Core is not going to be trivial. Um, and you know, if you think about the industry, this is billions. Is it you know potentially trillions? I, I actually couldn't find any real number uh, to use, but but I think it's a, a really substantial amount of code. And so uh, we've got to we've got to have a plan for .NET 4.5 and earlier. Um, yeah, so that's why I think you need to care about Bosch Windows. Um, .NET Core and Linux. So this is actually a little bit more exciting. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody last night about how um, Ansi from Pivotal was talking to him about about how kind of really game changing this .NET Core on Linux could be. I mean, it, it really seems to be that there's a portion of Microsoft that just could give a fuck about um, uh, Windows Server anymore. And, and that is a profound thing, right? I mean, imagine the, the power that Microsoft has if they were to put it behind uh, you know, a Windows uh, or a, a Microsoft Linux distribution, for example. Um, it really does change the ecosystem of .NET Core in a really profound and, and meaningful way. Um, and just being able to code now in C Sharp without having to use Visual Studio uh, is you know, something I've been waiting for for a long time. So um, it's just a really powerful thing. Um, and for a company like us, auditors just don't, they just care less about Linux. Regulators, for some, for whatever reason, they're just not as concerned. I think, uh, you know, you, you just, there's probably not a, a good reason for that anymore, but that is the case still. Um, Lim is complexity of CF. So now CF, you know, if you, if you think of it this way, you could have a CF deployment where you don't have to put Windows, and so all the bugs dealing with, for, for the boss to deal with Windows Server that may come up, they're just concerns you don't have. Um, this really makes it hard to, to leverage, well, you certainly are not gonna use IIS. Um, um, you're gonna use Kestrel or something like that. Uh, an Active Directory, you know, if you're using it for anything, it's as an LDAP provider, uh, you know, just strict authentication. Uh, and as I said before, it puts sort of .NET on par with open, op, other open source. Um, as I, I said to somebody the other day, it's, you know, .NET is now on parity with Ruby, uh, which is, <laughs> if you know, a great feat, but, uh, but certainly a, a step in the right direction. Um, okay, so a couple of things to, to consider if you're migrating. Um, so, uh, if you're really risk averse, like maybe we were, you know, shared environments is actually not a bad idea. You can actually uh, be more efficient, uh, get, a big, get a pretty good handle on your environment compared to just random distributed apps across random machines that you've created over the years. So if you've got a lot of legacy, it actually might not be a bad idea. It'll be easier to migrate to uh, because you don't have to follow all the 12-factor the rules and so forth that CF will require of you. 
Um, but if you're gonna go Bosch Windows, the first thing you need to do is learn about 12 factor um, and sort of the general idea of cloud readiness. Um, on the deck, there's a link, uh, 12factor.net. Um, this is a big one, remove dependencies on NFS. Um, you should do this anyway, um, because uh, this really ties your applications to specific nodes. Um, it really is a horrible protocol. Um, it makes WAN uh, use of your application very difficult. Um, it's just not a very cloud-friendly solution. Um, logging will need to change. Um, again, if you're, if you're used to, you, you get to pick your own VM and tailor where you write your logs and come up with your own deployment script. You can't do that in PCF, and you really shouldn't do it in a shared environment either. You really should have a consistent, and, and CF forces you to do that. Um, Make sure your apps are node unaware. Um, this seems easy, but I, it's, it's, I, I feel like I've told every developer at Schwab at least 10 times that this is something they have to do. Um, to, you know, anyway. Uh, off host session management, so try to avoid in memory, if, you're, if it's a web app, um, try to avoid ASP.NET session uh, in memory. Try to use the off host Redis's. Uh, Aerospike is. Um, is going to be available in CF soon as well, um, and there are others. I think Jim Fire might have a, a, an ASP.NET session interface. I'm not, I can't remember. Um, Externalize environment configuration. Hope we're at spring. I hope everybody already knows that. But but um, but if you're not doing that, it is absolutely critical uh, to being able to deploy thousands of cattle and, instead of thousands of pets. Um, um, Avoid joining an AD domain if you're going to use Bosch Windows. Uh, it just is going to get in your way. Um, and it's, it's really not necessary in this environment. You don't want people administering these VMs from um, in the old way. You want them to use the Bosch to use the Cloud Foundry mechanisms. Um, yeah, and avoid administering do nodes directly. So don't ever log into the nodes. In fact, don't let anybody log into the nodes, um, except in a testing context, maybe. Um, developers will claim they need this, even in your shared environments. It's bullshit. They don't need it. Don't let them do it. Um, uh, okay, so .NET Core and Linux, uh, yeah. Um, so this is all still true. Um, uh, but .NET Core is, is more like a port than an upgrade. I mean, there really there is some significant changes. And, and don't, don't uh, fool yourself that it's not significant. It's a good thing, um, but it's going to mean you can't you can't migrate easily. Um, I think the other thing that could be concerned about right now is Microsoft is really infamous for betas as GAs. I mean, this is really their you know they've done it for decades, right? They, it's a GA. No, it's not. Um, I think they've tried not to do that here. I think they've genuinely tried to uh, have .NET really go through its paces and its in their release candidates. So hopefully this is not a non-issue. But I'd be wary. Um, we don't know yet what the .NET Core support model is, besides what a few blogs have said. And I think this is a, a concern if you're, if you're a heavy user of Microsoft today and you expect them to work in a certain way. I ex expect it to change. Um, replace IS with Kestrel or web listeners. This is a big deal, again, for those who are heavily dependent on app pools and web configs and all those kind of contexts. Um, and then lastly, look to integrate CF managed services like uh, messaging, session management. There's data stores, Mongo just came out uh, uh, with a, a truly sharded replica set solution inside of CF. Um, so that's really inspiring. And I got five minutes left and I'm done. So there you go. Uh, any questions? Sure. What's up, Rob? Let's talk about how your architecture team, you know, once you um, decided this is what we're going to do for targeted applications to, to migrate them or to take new applications off. Can you just talk about how your architecture team spoke with the development community and got them going in this direction and what their reaction was? So that you guys had a kind of centralized architecture. Yeah. Really yeah, so the question is how did we, um, how did, 
an ar centralized architecture group uh, work with development teams to, to kind of adhere to this and, and kind of learn to love it, if you will. Um, definitely a little carrot and a little stick. So um, some developers are happy to get out of the infrastructure game, to get out of the infrastructure specification game, and are just, you know, they're pushing us. Like, that's a good 30% of the community. Another 30% is much more reluctant and need information, and so we published a variety of decks, did <coughs> road shows at different sites, um, had people go to conferences to hear from the rest of the community. That worked really well. Uh, and then there's a group that just, you know, change is bad, you know, that 30%. And so that's, that's where um, corporate enforcement of policy helps, right? So a centralized team, we can pass standards and so forth and sort of kind of keep everybody in line a little bit that way. Um, but the, the CF in particular is a product that when most people, once most people start using it, they, they kind of don't want to go back. At least that's what I found with our developers. They're, they're very reluctant to go, to go back to the old way. Um, uh, sorry, in the in the back there, yeah. So in one of those slides, it is mentioned that replace IIS with Castron. Yeah. So are there any issues running IIS on Azure with Cloud Foundry and pushing apps to Cloud? Well, if you're using Bosch, uh, uh, window, if you're using Windows, right? Sorry, not Bosch. If you're using Windows, no, because IIS will run in Windows, but IIS is not going to run on Linux. So uh, if you want to do dot, .NET Core on Linux, um, the, you can't use it. I mean, it just simply won't run there. I don't know if they're planning. I, I haven't kept up on this to, to try to run, to have some version of IIS on, um, on Linux, but I'm pretty sure they aren't. And so this is, if you look at their blogs, this is what they say. Web listeners and Kestrel is, is everywhere. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be other options going forward. Um, and there'll probably even be some non-Microsoft uh, solutions. Um, yeah, go ahead, in the front. How did you manage the business end of stakeholders? Sounds like there was quite a bit of refactoring and, and migration. Did they come along and how, how did you manage expectations? Yeah, so the question is, um, how do we manage the, our business partners' expectations uh, on how much this would cost, how long it would take, those kind of things. Um, Again, a little carrot, a little stick. I think uh, it's pretty easy to convince them that the situation we had was inefficient. Um, they could see that as well uh, in terms of the time it took to get a server and then get the application running on the server and so forth. So by telling them, we're going to eliminate the time to get a server because you don't have to provision one, um, that, that uh, pretty much they, they were able to buy into that. Um, the other other thing is you've got a you you as a technology team have to have a hopefully you have some sort of budget that is your maintenance budget and you need to be using it. This is this is table stakes of the future. You, you have to move to these things, so you've got to spend some of that there. Uh, and then in some cases we could make business cases. In fact, based on slides like this one, we made several business cases that got us project funding. Um, I mean, because when you can avoid a thousand, you know, thousands of licenses, you can, that's eliminating cost, which means give us the money and we'll eliminate more of it. So what about movement cheese moments? Any of that happen? Yes. And you just got to move it anyway. Um, yeah, so you just... Was there, was there like full warning? Uh, was there user acceptance that you went through with the yeah. business? I think we're out of time in case everybody wants to go. But... Um, I mean, there, with every team, it's been different. But I would, I would say there hasn't been a reluctance to do this. I would say I haven't run into just full on, like, our team heavily influences the CIO and the CTO, which helps. I think you've got to have that buy-in at the, at the top level, and then it kind of people won't bother trying to fight with you. If, you. if you try to introduce this product and make this kind of change without having the CIO and the CTO and the other leaders on your side, you're going you're gonna to get resistance and you're going you're gonna to lose some battles. One of the things at the beginning was I assumed you were familiar with Cloud Foundry, so sorry yeah. about that. Um, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm just learning. Yeah, no, that's all right. No, so Bosch is a is you can actually read that statement and it pretty much tells you. But 
it basically is a brain that provisions your nodes in this in Cloud Foundry and knows when to uh, put an app on a particular node and take it off and to start new nodes and those kind of things. It handles lifecycle management of all of the servers in the environment. Um, and it's an element of Cloud Foundry. Yeah. Uh, I think we got we to end there, right? Yeah, okay.